In this video, I'm looking at the Victron MPPT 130. I'll show you how it performs with some tests. I'll also explain how much solar you can connect to it, and the wires and the fuse sizes, and a few tricks that might save you from destroying your MPPT in cold weather. Let's get started. For the first test, we are going to see how much higher our solar panel voltage needs to be above the battery voltage. I have a bench power supply that will simulate a solar panel, the MPPT, a shunt and the battery. The battery is at 13.34 volts, so Victron says 5 volts higher, so that would be 18.33 volts. So let's connect the solar panel. The voltage is now 17.78 volts and we are not charging. So let's increase the voltage. We have 18.2 volts. And the charge controller still cannot find the MPPT. So let's increase it a little bit more. This is exactly 5 volts higher than the battery voltage. But it's still struggling to find the MPPT. Let's go to 18 and a half volts. And the MPPT charge controller has now found the maximum power point and we're putting 94 watts into the battery. So why is this useful to know? If you're using a single 100 watt solar panel, it can have a VMP of 18 volts. On really hot days, that voltage will drop. If you're only using a single panel, you might not always have 5 volts above the battery voltage. That's why I recommend wiring at least two panels in series. It guarantees you will stay above the threshold even in very hot conditions. In the next test, we are going to see how long it takes for the MPPT to find the maximum power point. I've set the bench power supply to 20 volts and 5 amps. So let's see how long it takes. So that took us about 15 seconds. And now for the third test, how quickly does the tracker react when conditions suddenly change, like when a cloud passes over and the current decreases. Let's try it. We are now at 5 amps, 20 volts, that gives us 100 watts. So let's decrease the current. 4 amps gives us 80 watts instantly. That quick response means you don't lose much energy when the sunlight changes. Let's talk about what this controller actually can handle. This is a 130 model. The 100 stands for the maximum solar input voltage. More on this later. And the 30 is the maximum current it can deliver to the battery. So at 12 volts, that means roughly 400 watts of solar. At 24 volts, that means a double of 800 watts. But this model doesn't support 48 volts. Don't forget, there's also a maximum solar input current of 35 amps. Not something most people hit, but worth knowing. Let's talk about over paneling, because that confuses a lot of people. Every charge controller has two main limits. The first is the maximum voltage on the input, in this case 100 volts, and the second is the maximum current it can deliver to the battery, which is 30 amps in this case. Power is just voltage times current, so that becomes 30 amps times 12.8 volts, gives you roughly 400 watts. 
that's the nominal power this controller can push into the battery. There's a little bit of play here with a low state of charge and the almost fully charged battery. But here's the thing, solar panels almost never produce their full rated power. A 400 watt array might only give you 280 watts in real world conditions because of temperature, sun angle and other losses. So what happens if you connect more than 400 watts of panels to the charge controller? Nothing dangerous. The MPPT will just clip the output to 30 amps. That means if the panel could theoretically give you 500 watts, the controller will only deliver a maximum of 400 watts. You don't get the extra, but you also don't damage the controller. That's why people over panel. It helps you reach the controller's maximum output more often, especially on cloudy days or in winter when the panel's production is lower. The key rule here is that you can exceed the power rating, but you can't exceed the voltage input limit. Always keep that under 100 volts. But on the power side, it's fine to oversize the array. The controller will just limit the current to the battery to 30 amps. For example, you could put 600 watts of solar panels on this charge controller. On a perfect sunny day, the controller will still deliver 400 watts into the battery. But on cloudy days, you will get closer to 400 watts more often. That's the real benefit of overpaneling. You will save on costs because you don't need an extra charge controller. The amount of available MPPT charge controllers can be confusing. So let's take a look at Victron's website and show you the full lineup of charge controllers. The smallest version they have available is 75 volts, 10 amps. They work on 12 and 24 volts and we have one working on 48 volts. Then we move on to the one I'm reviewing, 130. They work on 12 and 24 volts. Then we move on to the models that also work on 48 volts with a maximum input voltage of 150 volts. Then we move on to the larger 250 volts input models. They also work on these battery voltages. They have an optional display. The next one has an MC4 input. These go up to 250 volts and 100 amps. And lastly, we have the largest MPPT RS. They go up to 450 volts input and 200 amps output to the battery. And they only work with 48 volt battery systems. Let's talk about the maximum input voltage, because this deserves some attention. Victron says you can use the panel's VOC, that's the open circuit voltage, to make sure you stay under the 100 volt input limit. But I wouldn't stop there, because VOC rises in cold weather. Panels are rated at 25 degrees Celsius under STC test conditions, and in real life, on a freezing day, the voltage can be higher. Let's do the math. Say you've got a 100 watt solar panel with a VOC of 22.5 volts at 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit with a temperature coefficient of minus 0.4% per degree Celsius. Let's now see what it does at 0 degrees Celsius or 25 degrees Celsius colder. So we have the VOC of the panel times the temperature coefficient times the temperature difference is an increase of 2.25 volts over the VOC. And if we add this to the VOC of the solar panel, we have 24 volts 0.75 at 0 degrees Celsius. Now imagine you have four panels in series. At the normal STC condition, 
you will have a total of 90 volts on the input of the MPPT. And we just calculated 24.75 volts at 0 degrees Celsius. And that gives you 99 volts. So that's just on the limit of the MPPT. But if it's even colder, let's say minus 20 degrees Celsius, you will have 106 volts on the input and that can potentially damage the charge controller. You can use these formulas according to your local climate conditions or you can use a safety factor of 1.25. It's a simple way to cover cold conditions without running the mod every time. Using the rule of thumb, 22.5 volts times 4 times 1.25 safety factor equals 112.5 volts. So that's above the limit. So you cannot safely wire all panels in series. The safe options would be a maximum of three in series or two in series and two in parallel for a 2S, 2P configuration. At the end of the day, it comes down to your climate. I always apply the safety factor because I would rather be safe than sorry but you can decide based on the lowest temperatures in your area. Let's talk about wire and fuse sizes. On the battery side, the controller can put out a maximum of 30 amps. Multiply that by a safety factor of 1.25 and you'll get 37.5 amps. The closest fuse rating up is 40 amps. I like using MIDI fuses. They're compact, reliable, and cheap. And the cable rated for at least 40 amps is 8 gauge or 10 mm square. The maximum cable thickness the terminals accept is 6 gauge or 16 mm square. But that's really only needed for the battery connections. For the solar input, you rarely need that much thickness, unless you're wiring in parallel. And a quick tip. Always use ferrules on these connections. It keeps the wire strands tight and avoids loose copper strands. The MPBT has passive cooling in the back, so there is no noisy fans. The big heatsink in the back does all the cooling, which makes it silent. When you connect the charge controller, always connect the battery first, and then the solar panels. However, you should have a breaker before the MPPT. I'll make a video about it soon. But turn the breaker off when working with high voltage DC from the solar panel. That's dangerous. When you connect it to the MPPT, check if the voltage is correct and then turn on the breaker. The controller automatically detects the voltage of your system. But you still need to set the charging profile for your battery. Another thing is to place the charge controller as close to your battery as possible. That way you minimize the voltage drop on the output cables. Remember, the output side carries the highest current, which also means the cables are thicker and will be more expensive. So keeping those cables short will save you both power and money. If you're using a lithium battery, Set the rotary dial to position 7. Even if you've configured it in the app, it's good practice to leave the hardware switch set correctly. That way, if the app or the software ever fails, the controller still knows it's charging a lithium battery. This is the smart solar version and not the blue solar. The difference is Bluetooth. Smart solar has it built in so you can monitor and configure everything right from your phone. And honestly, for about $13 extra, it's worth it. Now, if you really don't want anyone messing with your settings over Bluetooth, even though it has a password, the blue solar might give you some peace of mind. But keep in mind, if you ever change your mind and want Bluetooth, the separate dongle will cost you $40. Both versions also have a VE Direct port, so you can hook them up to a Victron GX device 
for remote monitoring, but that's completely optional. Let's take a look at the Victron Connect app. You can download it for free on both Android and iPhone. When you first connect, the app will ask you for a PIN code. You will find that code on a sticker on the side of the controller. Or sometimes it will be inside the box. And once it's paired, the MPPT shows up in your device list. The very first thing I recommend is running a firmware update. After that, go into the settings by tapping the little gear icon. And select your battery type. In this case, smart lithium iron phosphate. I wouldn't change much else and I don't recommend enabling expert mode. The defaults are good. You might notice the charging voltage is set to 14.2 volts. A lot of chargers use 14.6 volts, but the difference in actual usable capacity between 14.2 and 14.6 is almost nothing, because that's the very top of the charge curve. The app also gives you a history tab with 30 days of data, and the live trend graph showing voltage, current and power. That's really handy for troubleshooting or just keeping an eye on performance. And finally, on the main status screen, you can see exactly what's happening. Solar panel voltage and current, battery voltage and current, and whether it's actively charging or idle. Price-wise, Victron has really come down over the last few years. They used to be on the expensive side, but now they're right in line with other brands. In my opinion, I think this is the best charge controller for the money. Sure, you can find an MPPT that's $20 or $30 cheaper, but for me, it's still a no-brainer. Victron has a proven track record, the build quality is solid, and the app makes it super easy to use. And there are frequent updates. I would rather spend that bit extra and get something I know that will last. If you want to grab one yourself, I will leave a link in the description. And let me know in the comments if you are using a Victron charge controller and your experience with it. You might also be interested in watching this video next. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.